Welcome to DLN Extend. We choose topics covered by the Destination Linux Network that we think need further discussion and extend the conversation here. These shows include Destination Linux, Ask Noah, Linux for Everyone, This Week in Linux, DOS Geek, Tux Digital, and Zebedee Boss Gaming. I'm Nate, Linux fitness and vintage tech enthusiast with an almost unhealthy obsession with the OpenSUSE project. And I'm Eric. Nate, what have you been up to this week? I've actually been up to a lot. I've been up to my elbows in electronics and Linuxy things. Well, that sounds fantastic. It is fantastic. It, it really is. I've, I've been enjoying it. I'm, I think I'm a little jealous. I've had none of that this week. Please tell me. <laughs> well, the, the server workstation thing that I've been working on, it's finally buttoned up. It's not all in pieces over my workbench anymore with you know panels here and there. I have everything put together. I, I got it so it's in a usable state. I'm still tweaking out the software side of it. Apparently, not using new enterprise-grade hardware is a, a little bit of a downfall uh, with OpenSUSE. Nothing against the project, but I can see where they definitely cater toward you know more enterprise-grade hardware. Not my cobbled-together mess that I have, but it's a great cobbled-together mess. I have seven hard drives in it. One hard drive is a one terabyte unit that kind of bootstraps the whole thing. It has the you know the, the G part of partition. I put some swap space on there and then root. And then I have my six drive array, RAID 10 array. And I don't even know if array is the right word. Is that the right, even the right word? It is. Yeah. The, the idea of a, an array is just the number of disks and that you are going to use them in combination. So good. Now I feel confident I can use the term array. So thank you. Those six drives are an array 10 configuration and that has my home directory and then it has SRV on there for the next cloud instance that I'm going to stand up for myself and so forth. Now I have a total of 12 SATA ports to plug into. All but one has something plugged into it right now. So I'm pretty excited about this beast. Well, sort of beast, old beast of a machine because it's not really new technology. It's mostly older stuff, but it's the most powerful computer I've ever owned and it's mine. So I'm really excited about it. You mentioned the possibility of needing a expansion card for additional SATA ports. Did you not need that? The board itself has enough? No, I, I did have an additional, I put an additional card. So the entire RAID array is on one card. Then my Blu-ray drive, my bootstrap drive, and any like external eSATA ports are on the motherboard. Got it. And yes, I have an optical drive on my computer because optical media is still important to someone who lives in rural America. Well, it's definitely not a dead medium. It's really not. I think certainly the convenience of getting things off of the internet and downloading, I mean, certainly you need it for updates and all that sort of stuff, but there are lots of reasons and advantages to having an optical drive, even if you don't use it on a regular basis. I've never actually had a Blu-ray drive before. Nope, that's not true. I do have a PlayStation 3, but I've never used the Blu-ray drive as a Blu-ray. But anyway, I've never actually watched a Blu-ray movie on in my home. So that's on the list of things to do. I'm really excited to finally enter into 2006. Well, you're not alone. I have never owned a Blu-ray player of any type, whether it be a console or anything. So you've now advanced beyond my capabilities. <laughs> we are on the cutting edge, man. You and me. Yeah, we are. Mm -hmm. I'm going to yeah. bust out my laser discs. <laughs> 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 yeah, for me, it's a turntable. I need to bust that thing out and start playing some records from 1983 or whatever. The other thing I did this week was install a new access point. I had my, my Linksys E2000 with a DDWRT decided it would stop doing things like authenticating devices. It would, uh, it would just kind of cut out on me and everything would fall off the network. And when you have a few things that do require wireless in the house, that, that does put a damper on your uh, joy of using the internet. I had to replace it as a stopgap with a WRT54GL that I pulled out of mothballs. So I had a whopping you know, 54 megabits per second uh, communication in the house. That was great. But it did the job. So no complaints there. So what I got was an Aruba. Well, I'm doing a little write-up on it where I was introduced to the Aruba was uh, this Maro Gaspari in the Das Geek channel. He told me I should check this out. It's what he uses, apparently, or what he's comfortable with. But he told me to get an IAP, not an AP, because I stands for independent. An AP requires some sort of a controller device, and I don't want to buy a controller. And he told me I don't want to buy a controller. So 
I got an independent access point, a 105. I, I don't want to spend a lot of money. I, I don't need AC. I mean, I probably should have gotten that. The price difference was about 50 bucks and you really got to ring my wallet hard to get any, any money out of it. So I got a IAP 105. I spent 20 bucks on it and it was so easy to set up. I actually didn't realize I set it up when I set it up. I, I put in the information. It automatically pulled all the information off my network as far as the from the DHCP server. And so it fed all that stuff forward pretty much just at a click. I didn't have to set anything up manually, which is what I'm used to. And it runs rock solid. It has all these different graphs so I can actually look and see how well each device is performing in the house as far as its throughput, the speed that it's you know connected and, and so forth. It's got, it, you know, it has all that little geekery tools built into it that, that kind of, you know, tickle my nerdy nerve endings. So that, that's been great. I, I have it all. I uh, got a power over ethernet thing so I can, you know, put it wherever I want in the house and uh, I might end up moving it, but right now it's, it's doing quite well. One of the things we wanted to do on DLN Extend was to also look at the social connections and uh, things being posted in the forum and on Telegram and things like that. So this week we had a couple different posts that I thought were interesting. The first one was from Brian from the Endeavor OS project, and he had written an article on the Endeavor blog about sometimes shake it off doesn't cut it. And the gist of it was basically that because they had to delay their net installer, which was supposed to be released, I believe, around this time, he had a lot of people coming to him and expressing disappointment. And I think in some cases, actually even being a little hostile or, or especially negative. And so this was really him expressing his frustration and also resolve around the idea that there are some vocal people in the community that will look at a project missing a deadline as being some sort of failure, when the reality is that deadline was slightly artificial to begin with. I think everybody has plans and they try to work towards those plans. But his basic point was, look, everybody working on this and by and large, most of the open source software that's out there are volunteers and they're people that are doing this in their spare time. Things happen. And when those things happen, you just have to give them the benefit of the doubt and realize that people are doing this out of the kindness of their heart and, and out of their own interest. Yeah. The reality is they have as much time as any of the rest of us have. And you think about your own life and working and family and all the commitments you have. Development isn't just you sit down for an hour and bang out some code and hope for the best. I mean, it's a lot of planning and thought and trial and error and testing. And they did have a version of the net installer available, but they made the decision because it wasn't finished, or at least to the quality that they wanted it to be. They made the decision that they wanted to hold it back and wait for it to be in a better state. And I think that was a good decision. To release something that's broken is just not a good move. It just it, it doesn't wear well for anybody. You know, I read this and, and it, it shocks me that there'd be so much negativity toward someone who is taking time out of their life to produce software for people to use. And really, for someone who complains because they didn't ship the, the net installer, like, what has it done to that person? Like, who hurt you, really? What, what is, how is this affecting you so negatively? You can't find a workaround. You can't use some other method of installing what you want. I was flabbergasted that that's even a thing. Like, how is that a thing? There was a buildup. They had publicized the fact that it was coming. I think there was a certain level of excitement and anticipation. And then they came out and said, look, it just isn't going to happen. You know, we've had some people leave the project. Um, we've had different situations and circumstances arise, and it's just not the right time to do it. I think that the overwhelming majority of people understand that, but of course, they're not the ones that are being vocal. And so they're not the voices that Brian's hearing. And so Brian is now, you know, has to internalize this and then realize that those people are, they're behaving the way that they're going to behave. And that is just sort of is what it is. And there's nothing that he can do about that. And in order to preserve his momentum and positivity around that, he just has to sort of shake it off. And, and he's saying in this case that maybe sometimes that doesn't cut it. And really more or less expressing his viewpoint is someone who is trying to build something and get it out there and having, unfortunately, a negative response to you know a situation that came up. My comment on that forum thread, the thought that popped in my mind was, how many people, when they contacted you to express their disappointment or their negativity or whatever, however they did that, how many of them in that same message said, oh, by the way, is there anything that I can do to help further this? Is there anything testing wise? You know, I'm, maybe they're not a developer. Maybe it's not something they can directly contribute code to, but maybe there's something that I can do to help this move forward because it's important to me 
it's important enough for me to reach out to you and let you know that I'm disappointed. And his response to me was that literally none, no one did. Literally wow. no one had said, it sounds like you need help. How, how can I help? Yeah. And I, I find that to be, first of all, telling because that shows that people are, they have enough time on their hands to reach out and express something that isn't the most positive message. And then also that they don't, it, maybe it doesn't even occur to them that they can help or that the right thing to do in that situation is to, instead of just thinking selfishly and saying, oh, I'm disappointed, to think, what can I do to help? It, it just surprises me still how much people, how hard they are on people giving them free software. I mean, when I have something that's broken or doesn't work, I don't get mad about it. I, I literally shrug and I go, okay, well, let's see if I can find a workaround. I realize, you know, from day one of using Linux, this is not commercial software. And in many cases too, thinking about that, I've had a better experience overall, of course, because I use Linux all the time, but I'm like, the, the product itself has been a better product than, than what I have purchased historically. So I, I don't know. I, I just, I'm, I'm really surprised by, by that. And it kind of makes me wonder too, is it, are these people complaining because they're genuinely angry or could there be some sort of a social disability that they might have? I'm, I'm not being, being, you know, I'm not saying that disparagingly, but I wonder, you know, sometimes people have a lack of conscientiousness and I wonder if that is part of it. It's down to the individual, but I think as a species, as a, as a human condition, maybe that anticipation and then not getting fulfilled leads to that sense of disappointment. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with being disappointed because you can be disappointed, but then realize that maybe there's something you can do to overcome that. And the something doesn't have to be complain. The something can be, I can be constructive and maybe there's something I can do financially or with my time, volunteering my time. Maybe one of the reasons that the devs don't have enough space and time to do certain things is that they're spending a lot of time helping users. And maybe so you can jump in the forum and help users. I think there's lots of different ways to contribute, collaborate, and ultimately lead to a better outcome. So being disappointed, it's a human thing. It's it's not, there's nothing inherently wrong with with that it's sure. the response you have to it it's to not fall into resentment because of the disappointment i think is the key the other topic i wanted to call attention to was we had a post about helping with manjaro someone was trying to do updates and they weren't working and they just couldn't figure out what was going wrong because they were doing what they thought they should do so i just took the time to go and look based on the error message that they had posted and was able to find the answer in the Manjaro forum and uh, get the answer and, and put it in the Destination Linux discourse forum. And the user was very appreciative. And I think you epitomize the the ideal user that is on the discourse as well. And I think that you can, if you look through the forum, you, you see a lot of that, that same kind, helpfulness, welcoming sort of feel, I think that makes this forum stand out among many of the forums out there. This week on Destination Linux, the boys brought up the topic about Google Project Nightingale. I've taken HIPAA training in the past, you know, from my, a previous employer, and it seemed like everything about that was legally questionable. So my career was with the same company for the most part. We were a third-party healthcare IT company providing technology and services. So we lived and breathed in, uh, by HIPAA guidelines. And I can remember how seriously we took even the smallest infraction around HIPAA. And yes, we had to have annual training on HIPAA and we had a HIPAA compliance department, a HIPAA hotline. And we, were, we took it very, very seriously because we had patient data. And we were storing that data. I mean, HIPAA is no joke. I know we all go to our doctors and they all have the, the sign-off sheets and the, you know, we all have to agree to that when we go and visit a hospital or a clinic. I'm curious to see, they, they opened an investigation into this to see whether or not this is considered legal. I mean, the cat's out of the bag, right? I mean, we're talking millions of patient records. This isn't like they're asking for permission. They're, they're sort of coming after the fact and saying, hey, we've already done this. Now it's a reaction to see if this is going to be withheld as being acceptable use for patient data. The thing is, like looking at the regulation, this is a direct violation of the privacy or security of, the, of health information. It's, it's a direct violation. If you go to the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, that's what you would check as, a, as the violation. I, I cannot see how they're able to weasel word their way around this. 
I really don't get it. We all want better outcomes, right? And we all, the promise of technology has been there for many years and it's not been capitalized upon necessarily in the most effective way. Hospitals have very tight budgets. It's not the easiest thing for them to implement these systems for other companies to bring these technologies to bear because of those limitations and funding and things like that. So, you know, Google has deep pockets. They want to get into this industry, I'm sure, to this facility that they, you know, they see this as a huge advantage for them to improve patient care. Zeb brought up a really interesting point, which Zeb's got a, a nice little cynical streak in him, which I, I love. It's very amusing. It, it is. And, you know, it's, it's funny because it didn't even occur to me, but he came up with the idea that maybe they would use this in a punitive way where insurance companies could data mine your medical records to such an extent that they can find loopholes or find cause to deny coverage based on some action that either was or wasn't taken at some point in your medical history because they, instead of just having a snapshot in time that like many institutions have, they really only have your data for the time that you are at that facility or the times you visited. Maybe you had a transfer of records or tests done elsewhere, things like that, but they rarely have the entire body of your medical history. Whereas, if a company like Google has access to all of these different providers and institutions, and now all of a sudden they literally have all of your medical data from the time you were born till the current moment, then you can start doing some very interesting data mining. And, I, and he's right. I could see insurance companies looking back through your records at your care over the years. And if you end up with a condition today that somehow they can point back and say, well, this wasn't handled properly. And so therefore now, you know, we're not going to treat this because of the actions, again, that were taken or not taken. That is a pretty scary situation. There's nowhere to, no way to hide from that. I mean, once that data is out there and, and there, it's being used that way, what recourse do you have? Unless if there's going to be some sort of legal precedent set for something that prevents that. I mean, again, I'm sorry, I'm stuck on the on what it's violating, you know, because of my HIPAA past. But so impermissible disclosures of protected information, health information. Wouldn't that be that very thing? Well, the question comes down to who owns that data, right? It should be us, the individual. Well, and that's that is supposedly what HIPAA is. Right. It's the patient's data. And it's why you have to sign a waiver and disclosure form if you want your spouse or a family member or anyone else to have that data disclosed to them. You have to say that it's okay. When you transfer medical records, you have to sign off on that. So all of it is taken very seriously in most cases that I've seen. And in this case, it just seems like this institution has overstepped what, what I would consider ownership of that data. The institutions themselves are supposed to have access to this data for patient care. The whole point of them having it, maintaining it, is the continuity of care and the ability for a practitioner to look back across time to see what has been done to you as a patient and then to use that data to make the best decision based on that, that information. And this is a case where, yes, by extension, they're using a third party to do that same thing, except that they've now furnished employees at Google access to patient health records. And has that re have those records been anonymized or de-identified? De we have no idea. And that's really the problem. Also brought up on Destination Linux was the statement that Linux feels slower. The discussion is because of the CPU vulnerability mitigations for Intel machines. I imagine there's probably also some applications have a little bit of bloat in it or whatnot. Personally, I thought it's because they're using GNOME. Haha, uh -huh. that was a bit of a stab. Got but him. Got him. No, not really. Um, <laughs> but even GNOME seems a lot you know, snappier now than it has you know, a year ago or two. I don't know. I have not really experienced the slowdown on my systems. In fact, I would say quite the opposite as of recent. Have you experienced a, seem a seemingly slower experience on Linux as of late? Personally, I think it's going to come down to how you use your system. If you have a reasonably modern machine, there is so much overhead available. I can think back to using computers years in the past where I was maxing out the system on a regular basis, whether that was the memory or the CPU or the disk throughput, you know, whatever the capabilities of that machine were, I was close to the ceiling, right? I was pushing it pretty hard. Now, the reality today for me is I do have some newer equipment 
and I have multi-core processors and I've, there's so much overhead on these systems that even if there was a 10, 15, 20% reduction in performance, I don't know that I would even notice it. And again, that's going to depend on very specifically how you're using your system. If you are maxing out your CPU with video rendering or maybe some of the CAD stuff you do or any situation where you are maxing out your system already and then they put some sort of mitigation in place that reduces your system's capability, in that case, then yes, I think you're going to see that and it's going to be noticeable and probably be really annoying to you because you more than likely have a system that you put time and effort into making very performant. And now a patch like this comes out and reduces that performance. Now, I have taken some steps to turn off the mitigations on my laptop. And even after doing that, I haven't noticed any boost in speed either. Zeb did talk about how me and him to do some testing on turning them on and off because you can do it very easily with OpenSUSE. I'm sure you can with any distribution, but there's literally a drop down for it to turn off mitigations or have them automatic or a few other varieties as well. I think like there's another option. I don't remember what it is, but to actually run some benchmarks on, on a variety of different variety of different benchmarks, you know, some like Blender, the Phronix, uh, there's another one like Geekbench, I think that Ryan suggested. I haven't gotten that far yet. I, I'm not a big benchmarks guy. I kind of just go by how does my computer feel today? You know, very subjective and it always feels fine. Yeah, pretty much always feels fine. Now, if I'm if I'm pushing it like with, with CAD, but it's only if I'm doing a lot with CAD. It, t- it takes a lot to really cause the the system to come you know screeching down to a halt. Really, it's more like rendering videos or or even rendering audio like when we export. But that's only for a few seconds or maybe a couple minutes at most. I don't really have that feeling that Linux has is slower today than it was. I mean, even Plasma lower resource usage and seemingly snappier now than it ever has been. I feel like there's a lot of efficiency coming out of out of the additional work that's being done on the Linux side of things. What would be interesting, and I have a sneaking suspicion that maybe older hardware that has to work harder to keep up or lesser spec systems with fewer cores, maybe slower memory, things where the CPU performance being reduced would be possibly much more noticeable. So I'm curious to see the feedback from people who are running machines like that, because I do think that there is a potential there for these mitigations to have an actual noticeable impact that would impact the, just the quality of, of you know that system and the usability of that system. My thing is, have they actually had issues where these vulnerabilities have been exploited? Are there other actual cases where they have been exploited and, and there's been data loss or, or a system compromised? Because everything that I've read, it's all been very theoretical and it doesn't seem very like there's anything really concrete on that. I think about it like Windows on my house, not the operating system, but the physical Windows. There are you know vulnerabilities in those windows just by sheer pressure, but it's not very likely someone's going to break a window. And it's not a very good example, but, but sometimes I wonder like how secure does something actually have to be or how hard is it to actually exploit this? You know, Michael did say that there was some sort of a, like a drive-by... A, a, a JavaScript vulnerability or whatever. Um, I don't know which vulnerability on the CPU it was, but there was a something could be done like on a drive-by website that's compromised that it, um, something could execute and compromise your system. But my understanding is Firefox has that vulnerability worked out. So how many layers of security do you actually need for one bespoke case, I guess is really what I'm getting down to. It comes down to the risk that any given system faces. And I would say again, from the home user sort of end user desktop system, this is probably much less of a concern for most people. The possibility exists, and that's really what it comes down to, is if you if the flaw is out there, it's well known, well studied, and isn't patched, then it's trivial at that point to exploit it. And so if there's enough of a target out there, then someone is going to exploit it. But what they're most likely focused on, and the people who should be most afraid of these types of vulnerabilities are critical mission critical systems systems with sensitive data systems where they are publicly facing and accessible by the internet it's going to be server based stuff for the most part so for someone in user land just a desktop system obviously i I totally agree if it's public facing and it's on all the time that needs to be protected but i wonder like for the desktop how critical is it really This week on Ask Noah, one of his topics was cryptoware targeting Nextcloud specifically, called Nextcry. 
I'm sure most people are aware of what cryptoware is, but if you're not, essentially it's malware that encrypts data. And then the only way to get back that data is to pay the attacker to get the encryption key. And then believe it or not, in most cases, if you pay them, they will give you the key because it's profitable and they will be honest about giving you the key once you pay them for a dishonest act. So take that for what you will. Yeah, that surprises me. (laughs) <laughs> it does. But I guess technically they won't ever benefit from it if they don't get paid for it. But I guess it would be easy enough for them to just take the money and then never give you the key. But for some reason, from what I hear, a lot of these people actually follow through and will give you the key. And they'll tell you how to patch your system so it doesn't have happen again. That's almost like a, like a vendor service, you know, getting you to fix your systems, I suppose. Yeah, that just seems really odd. Beyond the oddity of this type of arrangement, Noah's point basically being the other way around this is, of course, by having backups. So that if your next cloud instance is attacked and encrypted and you now no longer have access to that data, if you have a snapshot of that data somewhere else, it doesn't matter because they've locked down that particular instance of data. But if you have a backup somewhere else, then you just go to that backup and fix whatever vulnerability was there. And uh, Noah did say that NextCloud very quickly put out a patch for this. So the newer releases of NextCloud aren't vulnerable, at least to this attack. But one of the things that keeps coming up with people's distrust of hosted services, Google being an example, or iCloud, or any of the sort of online services, storage, that kind of stuff goes beyond just those two, obviously, is the reaction of, well, just make a NextCloud server. Just go out there and on DigitalOcean or wherever and buy a $5 a month plan and follow the instructions to install NextCloud and, uh, and you're fine. And as a server administrator, I have a lot of of hesitation around just recommending that an average person undertake self-hosting anything, let alone something like NextCloud. Now, if you are going to be diligent and take the time to educate yourself on how to manage a server that is public facing, okay, then great. Go for it. Take the time, learn, do the best practices of hardening the server, make sure your firewall's in place, make sure you've got your SSH set up and keys and make sure you're running your updates and at a minimum, the security updates. You have to be diligent when you're running servers. I think anyone should have the responsibility that if you're putting something out there, and and trust me, if you have anything that's public facing on the internet, you are going to get attacked continuously. I run websites that get thousands of attacks every week, and it's, it's just constant poking to look for vulnerabilities. That's amazing. Don't just think because DigitalOcean or someone else, oh, well, they know what they're doing. You know, they've got the right controls in place. They're built to give you flexibility to do what you want on your system because that's what people who know what they're doing want. They will do a baseline, sort of a best practice approach to some of this stuff. But by and large, it's up to you to do the work to make sure it's secure. And so my soapbox moment of the week is to say for all the people that are just knee jerk saying, well, just set up NextCloud. It's that easy. And it is. It is easy to set up because it's a snap on an Ubuntu based server that's literally four commands and you're done, but it's more to it than that. At the very least, make sure you have a backup that isn't on the same server. Because if you have a backup on the same server and the server gets compromised, then that backup is compromised as well. Noah basically went through, and I'm not going to reiterate everything he said, but he's doing this on a professional basis, doing this for companies, setting up these instances for them and doing it in the right way. But he's also not making them do backups. He offers them a solution. He tells them why it's important. But in some cases, they may not follow through on that. And if they don't, and then they get attacked by something like this next cry deal, then he can only do so much to help them. And he even said that obviously publicly facing, you don't ever say, well, you just pay the ransom. But hey, if you're in a situation where that was the only copy of your data and now you can't get to it and it's mission critical, guess what? You're paying that person for that encryption key because that's all you got. I think there's some there's a bright spot in there somewhere. From my perspective, next cry means that hey, next cloud has arrived. It is a solution to your your own cloud issues or your own cloud needs. That's good news. It means you are now a target. You you've arrived. <laughs> But the the thing with the, with the backups, though, I'm actually surprised that businesses don't have better backup solutions than they do. It just seems really wild to me that that's that's an issue. It seems like it's a not a very expensive solution to 
implement either. Maybe I'm wrong. I just do offline backups in my house and I have some syncing going on. If I was somehow compromised, it wouldn't be but maybe an hour of, of work to really get everything back to where it should be. So it just it surprises me that a business who makes money off of their data, essentially, wouldn't do a better job of, of securing their assets. Some of it is knowledge. And I will tell you that small and medium-sized businesses, and medium size can encompass a pretty substantial size business. They don't have IT departments or they don't have the bandwidth in their IT departments or they don't have the depth of knowledge in their IT departments. They tend to outsource a lot of things. But just like with Noah, with AltaSpeed, they offer the option. They explain why it's important, but you can't make them do it. It's their prerogative. This week on Linux for Everyone, System76 had a superfan event. It brought in a lot of people uh, from d- different content creators and whatnot. So, of course, Jason Evangelo was there, and they kind of went through the, the design process and how long, how many iterations and how long they've been working on building new machines. And, and it was actually neat hearing how they went from uh, where they started to more or less buying and having stuff contracted out to where they're actually manufacturing and producing large bits of it here in the United States and, and I think Denver, Colorado. And I think that's a really neat trend that's happening right now is, you know, computers, you know, in the 1980s, they were largely made here in the United States back in the 6502 days of, from Moss Technologies. That manufacturing plant was in Pennsylvania. Now, pretty much no chips are made in the United States. But it's neat to see that there is manufacturing coming to the United States and they found that it's more economical for them to build what they want in Denver, Colorado. And that kind of excites me. One, that means that manufacturing or the, the methods of manufacturing are more efficient now that we can do it from anywhere, you know, thanks to technology and, and so forth. And also the, the time between idea to delivering a product is greatly shortened when you don't have all that logistics time of moving stuff from one country to another, from one side of the earth to another. So that was really exciting to me. And the look of the Thaleo also, and also the, how they, they built the whole story behind the Thaleo and, and the different robots and, and whatever else kind of appealed to the, the Transformers fan inside me from my childhood. And it was just really exciting to see the passion that they had for their products. Now, I'm not a, I'm not a huge fan of Pop! OS so much. I think it's a great product. But I do like how they have, they've got this, this branding from Pop! OS to um, their website, to their computers, that all the, the brand kind of is all gelled together. It's, it's a cohesive product. And the Thalia is a really neat looking computer, that, that wood grain on there. It has this, I don't know if it's brushed aluminum or what, but that industrial, but almost warm, soft feel kind of combined together. I think that's a new thing right now anyway. It looks really good. It's, an, it's a neat looking machine and they, they're producing some really neat hardware. And if I were invited to a super fan event, I surely would make my way there because the whole experience seemed like it was a really great time and very, you know, rah rah for System 76, for the employees. I'm sure it felt good for the employees there and for everyone that they invited. Oh, and they gave uh, they gave away some Thalios too, which I thought was pretty cool. We've heard for such a long time about the decline of the desktop PC market and, uh, and also even laptops themselves and moving towards mobile devices being the predominant computing device in most people's lives. And I'm not going to refute that claim. But I do have to say that a a small American company showing these types of signs of success to where not only are they able to grow and put on an event like this, but also that they're going to start manufacturing their own laptop hardware and just expand their capabilities. And it's all Linux first and by all accounts seems to be doing very well and is successful. There's something very satisfying about that to me. It's probably all those things combined, right? You said it's, you know, it's an American company that's able to produce its own products to an extent. I mean, there's still a lot of stuff that they're going to have to get from others. And that- oh, they're still, they're still globally sourced, but it's they're, they're, they're manufacturing, putting it all together here as opposed to elsewhere. You mentioned the Thilo. So I am not a huge gamer aesthetic type of person. And so I don't love RGB and all the super goofy flashy stuff that seems to be the what is available on the market now. So when I see a system like that, that's elegant and I would say slightly understated. I find that to be interesting and it shows a certain character to me that that's, that's sort of the market that they're going for. And the fact that they were able to develop it and build it and they're doing it here by all accounts, again, being successful at doing that and looking to do that now for their laptops as well. And yeah, putting on a, a an event like this for creators and journalists to be able to come and peer behind the curtains and see 
how they're doing it and to be able to get that information out there. It's, it's, it's wonderful stuff. One last thing this week, we got feedback in the discourse forum about not being aware of the podcast and that the launch was perhaps not visible enough. And I'd say that's a fair point, and it speaks to the challenge of getting the word out on any kind of new content that's being created. We announced it on Destination Linux and the usual social channels, and that went on for several weeks, and we do announce each episode on those same social channels as they come out. We're also on all of the major podcast publishing platforms, so we should be there for folks to search and find things. We've done everything we can do in terms of short of advertising or finding more aggressive ways to market the podcast. And I think this sort of gets us to the point where word of mouth is a big factor in this as well. Obviously, as we get more listeners, hopefully those folks are enjoying it. They're going to share it with others, and then there'll just be a broader visibility based on that. So we've asked before, and I guess I'll ask again that if you are listening and are enjoying this, Maybe not assume that everybody else has heard of it. And if you would like to, we would certainly appreciate you considering sharing it with friends and others. We'd like to continue the discussion with you on Telegram, Discourse, Mumble, or Discord. Visit the DLN website for information on how to connect to the social channels and also on shows and creators for the DestinationLinux.network. For more information on where to find us, for me particularly, I like to hang out on the DLN Discourse Forum, and all of my social and content stuff is under destinationlinux.network in the creators section. You can find me there, as well as cubiclenate.com. Links to my regular written blatherings and podcasts and YouTube channel can all be found there as well. As always, we thank you for joining us. We'll be back next week with another episode of DLN Extend. Until then, have a great week, everyone. See you.